Welcome to Farming for Health, where Farmer Lee Jones and I talk with leaders in food, farming, and health and wellness to spread knowledge and inspire a plant-forward future, starting now. Welcome to the Farming for Health podcast. I'm Dr. Amy Sapola, and today I have the pleasure of being joined by Chef Reem Asil. She's founder of Reem's California Mission in San Francisco, California, and she's the author of Arvia, Recipes from the Life in, of an Arab in Diaspora. Thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it. It's such an honor to be able to talk with you, and I know you're flying high off of just winning an award for your book, so let's talk <laughs> yeah. first about that. Yeah, I'm just coming off of a 10 day uh, le- East Coast leg <laughs> um, oh of gosh. traveling. And um, I was out in New York for the International Association for Culinary Professionals. It's a pretty prestigious uh, organization um, that yes. really celebrates food journalism and uh, food media um, and I just got an award for the cookbook category for chefs. So oh, congratulations. Really That's yeah. so well-deserved and yeah. amazing. So I wanted to start off just hearing a little bit about you. But first, I wanted to read a quote that I found on your website. And I really just thought this was beautiful. So um, it said, in 2010, the dream of Reams was born at the doorstep of a street corner bakery in Beirut, Lebanon. It was in watching the bread flying out of the oven literally into hungry people's hands and witnessing the life inside those bakery doors, despite the political turbulence outside of them, that I realized my people are masters of bread and hospitality, the lifeline of our history and what has kept us resilient over many generations, despite colonization, war, drought, and famine in the Arab world. So, wow, that's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, so That is it in a crux. <laughs> yeah. So I was hoping you could talk more about hospitality and bread and how they've impacted your life and why they're central to like your guests' experience. Yeah. Well, I would start off by saying I wasn't always a baker. Um, the food, uh, food industry, I came into the food industry officially in 2010 okay kind of in a backhanded way most people get into it for the love of food I I certainly had a love of food but it was really for the love of building community that I became obsessed with bread Oh, um yeah so I was prior to that trip that I took to Lebanon in 2010 I was um, a community and labor organizer I was working um, on policy and cities in Oakland where I reside um around you know um community benefits as we call them right that these cities uh have these amazing communities and then but unfortunately the development of those cities really uh caused um a displacement right of Mm -hmm. people and um not really an investment in the actual people who are living there and we were fighting a really good fight to hold you know, city council members uh, account- accountable <laughs> to making sure that when um, development projects were happening, that they were providing good jobs and affordable housing and all of these things. And it was, you know, really an exhilarating fight to be trying to give voice to people in their neighborhoods and in their jobs. But uh, but the fight was hard. Uh, it was hard to mobilize people to get them to imagine what they could be asking for or fighting for. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was like no alternative. So when I saw the street corner bakery in the Arab world, I was like, ah, this is what, uh, this is the thing, right? Like these yeah. pieces of life, right? And a lot of times in no matter where you go in the world, um, the spaces that provide m- m- the most life, the most connection, um, the most resilience are in the food spaces. And then I think that the, you know, bread is such a transient uh, thing, right? Like who doesn't eat bread? Like all cultures have some form or version of it. So it yeah. became that could cross different lines, different experiences, different 
And I think that that was like the magic sauce, right? I was like, oh, you know, my my people are masters of hospitality, but like, what does it mean to put Arabs in a diasporic setting? Everywhere we go, we connect with the communities around us. Let's celebrate that. And, you know, at the time I had grown up in, the, I, I'm, I'm a, I was born and raised in the States. I often felt like a stranger in a strange land. You know, there's, it's not a secret that, you know, that there is a lot of anti-Arab sentiment, whether it's through our government's foreign policy or the media. And I wanted to challenge those stereotypes and those narratives to say like, actually, Arabs have been part of this cultural fabric um, in the US, but you don't even know it because we've been hiding, right? And yeah. so this was a way to be like loud and proud, Here's our thing. Who doesn't love fresh baked bread? <laughs> you know, right? Oh, um, that's amazing. Yeah, and bread was kind of born in my region of the world, right? Like it was. If you root it back all the way back to when you know humans became more than just foragers, but actual cultivators, like we were grinding the grain and realizing that if you mix it with water, <laughs> it makes dough. Yeah, uh, there's something really beautiful about that: the longevity of it and celebrating that history. Tell me about your journey to learning bread too. Like that's not something I feel like you just like one day like, oh, I'm just going to oh. bake amazing bread today. So I'm a bona fide nerd. Um, I mean, food had always been in a, the backdrop, even when I was on the front lines, organizing, doing my activist work, working in nonprofits. I was always cooking and baking, baking in particular. Uh, I'm not sure if it's because my mom was, she's a scientist, oh, very nice. like chemistry you know and so I was always really attracted to the alchemy yeah. of baking. the idea of like you're taking all these things and combining them and changing their chemical makeup into something that's completely different and magical and living so there's like the micro <laughs> the bio biology part of that that's really amazing um so yeah I became I was like if I'm gonna start an enterprise that is like this I need to be an expert and I quit my job. I got, I enrolled myself into a baking and pastry um, program at the community college um, that uh, in Oakland, shout out to Laney Culinary. Um, and I just kind of cut my teeth in bakeries and I was a pastry chef. And, you know, what's funny about in this industry though, is that as I was learning most of my learning was happening on my own. It was like reading, you know, the, the the bread books and the watching YouTube videos because in the bakeries, women are often relegated to sweets and pastries where all the men somehow got all the bread shifts. And I was, you know, I worked in a co-op at the time and I was like, no, I want to learn bread. And so yeah. like I did a point to to make my way over and we were a, sourdough california style uh bakery yeah so i became then i was like sourdough what is this thing it's very california it's you know yeah. and the more i learned about california approach to both baking and cooking um the more i realized actually my people had this all along they were like doing this this is like the old way of doing things tell me and more so about that back like, to my roots. <laughs> yeah tell me more about what is the california approach and like how it dates back yeah, I mean, I think the California approach is really celebrating what's on the land, mm -hmm. right? And, yes. um, you know, Arabs, yeah, you know, where where my family's from, we're from the what you call the Levant, which kind of uh, uh, is uh, envelopes the Mediterranean, and it has this really beautiful climate, not different than California. <laughs> Um, and so we cook seasonally, we, we really approach food seasonally. So it was like a natural flow in my evolution as a chef, um, not just as a baker, but as a chef to really think about how, um, how do we bring these kind of local produce to life? I worked at a pizzeria where like every day was a different topping and it was one topping and it was like, why, you know, and we got to kind of really, uh, play with ingredients. So I think that was one. Um, obviously, sourdoughs, like living off the organisms that are around you and this kind of uh, ever evolving thing and like having a relationship to food as a living, breathing thing. I feel like that's in a lot of cultures, like 
what we do, right? Like we really, food is not just subsistence, but it's like, it's culture, it's life. Um, and, you know, I always joke that when I do like my bread baking classes, like that was like, the Egyptians were like making beer <laughs> and they forgot to like clean the thing, like, you know, clean the barrels that they were making the beer. And that's like how, you know, sourdough was, or like, you know, starter. Yeah. When a natural yeast was created. So um, there's so something cool. really amazing about that. Yeah. And when it comes to hospitality, like how do you do it better? Right. Like what, yeah. what does hospitality mean to you? And then like, how do you, how do you bring that great hospitality? Yeah. A note from our sponsor. Farmer Jones Farm provides nutritious, regeneratively grown vegetables to home cooks nationwide. If you are searching for vegetables grown in a way that's healthy for you and good for the planet, try a curated box from Farmer Jones Farm. Get 15% off your order with the code FARMINGFORHEALTH15. I think for me, hospitality is making you feel a sense of ease mm. and belonging. It's like, what can we do to let all your senses down? And I think what Arabs do really well is like, we'll give you the shirt off our back. You know, like that's how much of a virtue. It's like, it's a thing that's kept us alive, right? I mean, we used to... I mean, if you think about the history of Arabs, uh, you know, we're the Bedouins who were moving through the desert, like you could come upon strangers and like those strangers could kill you. <laughs> um, so you better be like as hospitable as possible, right? Like we're going to kill them with kindness kind of thing or like save ourselves with kindness. And so it really, when I like read about that, I'm like, oh, that's so fascinating. Like that, that it's like actually a survival technique. But it's a virtue that makes us feel proud. I think like the fact that we may not have that much, but we'll make you feel that abundance and we'll make you feel a sense of ease. Maybe a little sense of discomfort because we like to stuff you. <laughs> You're like, oh, I'm good. No, no, that's you want more, right? So I always say like Arab hospitality is like sweet torture. Yeah, I mean, no, everybody wants to feel like they belong. And it's very, um, I guess the other thing about Arab hospitality that I think is really, I'm sure other cultures have it. There's a virtue that we have in the, the exchange, but there's an expectation we have for you to engage in it. And the more oh. you give into it, the more magical it's going to be. Like, you don't want to kill our vibe. Like, if we're trying to treat you, yeah. Uh, like saying no or like rejecting like hurts us, you know? So it's like yeah. you're equally as responsible for being a good guest or engaging. Uh, oh, so I feel like it's very participatory in that way. And that's kind of how I approach my restaurants, you know, like come as you are. We invite you to come in as you are, like feel at ease. Um, and like, if you like something, let us know we'll give you even more like we, we want your affirmation we want we, you know it's, it's like it's like this fun game um and i i feel like that's how restaurants should be it shouldn't be like we're at your service and you don't participate in that experience but yeah the more you participate the the, the more magical that experience might be Oh, that's so cool. I love that philosophy and just like that yeah. way of interacting with people and what a way to build community too. And I think, as you mentioned, that was kind of the genesis of all of this is building community. Can you speak to how, how the restaurant and, you know, baking the bread, how has that built community locally? Yeah. I mean, I think, um, Nostalgia is kind of a funny word, but like we wanted to evoke some kind of senses, right? Like, and the the idea of warmth just kept coming up for me of like, I don't know, there's like nothing, like if the, the idea that something is like baked just for you, right? Mm -hmm. Like, like literally the warmth of it, right? But then, um, yeah, that warm feeling of, uh, walking into a bakery. I mean, I feel like people have that nostalgia, the smells, the scents, all of that. And so we wanted to create, like when I was creating my restaurant, I was like, who do, who do I imagine in here? And I imagine people from all walks of life. Okay. So I'm going to be in a densely diverse neighborhood so that we get that. Cause obvious also people don't know Arab food, right? It's like the scary thing or 
it's all relegated to like hummus and falafel, but we're obviously more than that, you know, how do we get them in something that feels accessible, feels familiar? And so like flatbread is a familiar thing, right? We were in Latinx neighborhoods. It's like no different than the tortilla. You know, when we were a, a street stand, you know, we got our start actually at a farmer's market. Uh, we were like, you know, cooking our flatbreads on a griddle and topping it looks like a pizza, you know? So, so people are like, oh, what is that? That looks so unique. So there's curiosity, but there's familiarity. So we wanted people to feel at ease that like they're going to be welcomed into something, even if they don't know what it is exactly, but it's like familiar enough where they can access it. Um, so that was one thing. Um, so like having the hearth, you know, when you enter and seeing the bread come out uh, and seeing our, um, our cooks, like literally in front of you making it felt very important. Um, the colors, uh, the vibrancy, we didn't want like to be some cliche, you know, like this is a foreign place. No, this is like, we're in California. Like we wanted, so we were really intentional about the color scheme. Um, and then just like uh, who you attract, right? Or who like you, who works in your space attracts a certain amount of certain kind of people, right? So we wanted to make sure that the people who worked at Reams reflected the neighborhoods that we're in. So then people feel more comfortable. It's like, oh, they look like me. They, you know, yeah. and then even for our destination people, you know, we, I mean, we are a destination spot. We, the way that we kind of set up the space really makes you have to engage, right? With other people. It's communal in that sense. You have to wait in the line. You talk to each other about the menu. In fact, I would say like, our farmers market lines for very uh for for many years were like the jam right because you just make friends in the line and you talk about if you've had it before and give people recommendations so oh, it's like so cool. trying, trying to find ways for people to engage with one another communal tables uh we were like a small uh humble space so uh all of those things really matter uh when you're building a community like space I think that's amazing. So when um, one of the other things I wanted to talk to you about is the film that you're part of, Normal Ain't Normal. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I saw the trailer for it, and it looks great. Can you describe the film and just your experience with being in it and creating yeah. it? Yeah. So Normal Ain't Normal, the premise of Normal Ain't Normal was like during the pandemic, uh, and really in 2020, everybody was like we want to go back to normal you know everybody kept saying we want to go back to normal and I was like that was not normal right <laughs> I don't want to go back to that you know and so um at the time um my friend from Offside Productions was like kind of coming up with this concept and I was telling him I was frustrated with you know how people were dealing with the restaurant I mean because you know you heard it in the the space of food a lot right that we wanted to go back to normal and I really did not want to go back to the way things were I didn't like what we were going through obviously I was struggling to keep my restaurants alive I was watching my employees families getting sick I mean people were dying all around us and we had to be frontline essential workers and it was horrible it was traumatizing and so I needed something I needed an outlet to like really talk about this grief. And so the act of co-writing that with um, Offsides was really cathartic for me. Um, you know, as the kind of owner, I was, I felt like I was trapped in the cogs of capitalism, as I would call it. Like I was like this middle person between my employees that were, obviously they were suffering, right? A lot of them couldn't get unemployment. Um, and then these forces that I had no control over, like uh, not getting aid, landlords coming after us for rent, and I was I felt powerless. And so I wanted to really explore what that was like for small business owners, like how we were caught up in this. And we were, you know, obviously play accomplices in this in some ways. Um, and yet we were powerless, right? Like we, I couldn't even feed my kid, you know, like we, yeah. 
we were struggling too. Um, so it was really cathartic to think about radical imagination of like, wait, I don't want to go back to normal. You know, I'm, I'm like, I'm calling it right. Yeah. <laughs> and I called a lot of people out in that, that film, um, you know, the restaurant, me like food media that let us down this, uh, government, obviously, um, you know, all of, all of the big corporate chains that were taking all the PPP money. I mean, I, I left no one out in this uh, film. So it was kind of cathartic in that way of like, uh, -uh like, yeah. yeah. Um, but it was, it was great and it was very well received. And, you know, the point we were making is that like food workers who can't, who are hungry, they're feeding everybody else and they're hungry. That is not normal. Right. right. Um, partnered sure. with, uh, one fair wage um so it was like we wanted to use media not just to kind of like laugh at it and use we needed comedy right like it was, you know I was like basically like stream of thought like this is what's going on in this chef's mind <laughs> um but we also wanted to like get people riled up enough to actually have impact on the issues the policies around living wages. I mean, mm -hmm. we're, we're still living in a country where most of the states, you know, we're lucky in California, but um, most of the states have sub minimum wage for workers, right, that they rely off tips um, to, to feed their families like that is not normal. Right. <laughs> um, so hopefully it compelled people enough to think about, okay, there might be alternative models that really like center uh, the well being of employees. Yes, absolutely. And I think one of the things I noticed too in reading your story is that you really have overcome some really big challenges. So COVID, I know um, your restaurant, after opening your restaurant, then there was COVID. Um, and then you had an oven explosion. You had an oven explosion. Yep. That was lovely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So can you tell me more about this and like how, yeah. how you keep going and how do you overcome that and like uh, how does that show up in the next iteration well I don't want to romanticize it too much right. no. of today it feels like I look back on how I was able to like how Reem survived over this last eight or nine years um and I'm like that's crazy like nobody should ask of a woman a mother uh any anybody really um to do what I did to make sure that things kept moving. And yet, like, I feel like a lot of mom and pops folks, like we we knew what to do during the pandemic because like we nothing changed for us. It was always hard. <laughs> right. uh, in fact, the government money, like finally coming down, helped us a little bit uh, in, in a way that like we've never gotten, right? Um, and I wish that that money was more equitably distributed to the people who were really creating good jobs that were building resilience in there. Like it would have been a different story if we had really thought about how we allocated money. Um, but we had always been, I mean, I bootstrapped my business. I like, you know, a, a lot of uh, the first, you know, my first restaurant in Oakland was like friends and family loaning me money. Um, so we've always known how to, and we were like a farmer's market operation. So when our oven exploded, we're like, all right, I guess we're going to be on the road. Like, I'm a refugee. We, we know how to do this, you know? And we, um, that said, I mean, we couldn't have done that without, uh, we had built community along the way. And that's always been Reem's ethos is like, don't build it and then they come, just build it with them and then they'll be invested, right? Mm -hmm. And so like when our oven exploded, people reached out to us and we we're like, oh, actually you could help us when are you closed? You have an oven. Can we do a pop up there? Like, and so we strung along uh, a few <laughs> ways for and we went back to the farmers markets, we had the partnerships with those um, organizations. So it was hard on our employees to do that. Like we shouldn't have had to do that. Mm -hmm. But that was the reality that we were in. So we were, you know, we're like, how are you able to pivot? I'm like, I don't know what pivot really means. Like we we just we have to like rely on community and do yeah. what we can do. Um, that said, I think 
you know, and I think normal a normal alluded to this a little bit. Um, uh, that that's not normal either. Like I, capitalism shouldn't make you work this hard just mm -hmm. to take care of your people. Like, you know, um, right. we 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 still had people sick, and we were working short staffed a lot of times. We were the last people to open our doors inside. <laughs> San Francisco because we wanted to make sure that our employees felt safe and that was like a decision that we made that made us less competitive right mm -hmm. so there was a series of things that Reams did over the last eight years that uh, have really made things difficult for us now um, coming out of the pandemic that we have to answer for and I wish that there were players out there that like would reward that but um, at the end of the day, this country still is about production and, you know, profit and all of these things. Um, so that I think has been hard. And as a mom, I've slowed down, uh, as you probably yes. <laughs> uh, can relate to. It's like, I can't do it all. Um, I'm very lucky that I have a really great team that has really stepped up, I think, with the pandemic really, you know, helped fortify who was who was in it to win it. Um, and yeah, we did a lot of investment during that time to make sure that that happened. So. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so you mentioned being a mom and being a business owner and all the things. And one of the things I always like to talk about is like, how, like, what do you want for your son as far as how he grows up and like how he experiences food um, and like the relationship he'll have with food as well or has currently. Yeah, I have the misfortune um, of having a boy that does not like to eat anything except for, I mean, luckily for me, bread. Oh, good. <laughs> He's very picky. And I was like, why? What did I do to deserve this? <laughs> like, did I have bad karma in another life? You know, I thought I was killing it at the beginning. He would like eat all my cooked foods and yeah. slow over time. And I know that they get picky, um, but I still try to celebrate the stories of food. Like for me, it's not just about the eating of food, but it's like the appreciating of food. And so he watches me cook, the act of cooking. He We bake together. He loves baking because he loves sweets, right? Um, so you know, understanding ingredients and how they go together. And so I'm starting him really young from that. You know, he knows, um, I think he knows that I, we have these bakeries. He's like, so mama, do we have enough money for the new bakery? Like he'll like, <laughs> ask him those questions. So like, he's very well aware that like, that I'm building an enterprise that is more than just food. Yeah. Which I think I, that that is something I want him to see. Um, and yeah, I mean, the, I think the act of cultivating and cooking, maybe one day he will want to eat and want to explore, but I don't force things, um, because I want him to have a good relationship with food. I don't want him to feel like he has to eat it. Um, so I couldn't yeah, agree more with that. Yeah. yeah. I think that's yeah. so important not to force it and they, they'll come around eventually. And, you hope. I mean, we live in, we live in <laughs> California too. Um, yeah. So like we go to farmers markets, we like I try to show him like you can grow plants like I would love I mean, to answer your original question, I would love for my child one day to wait, like wake up and be like, I'm hungry. What's in the garden? You know, yeah. be like what's in the fridge or what's in the snack? Uh, you know, we're not there yet, though. He's five. So I yeah. have to be patient. Yeah. Oh, for sure. And I know you mentioned too, like the color and the vibrancy of your restaurant and how does that color and vibrancy, how does that show up in your food and that freshness yes. of California? A message from our sponsor. Farmer Jones Farm provides nutritious, regeneratively grown vegetables to home cooks nationwide. We seek to provide our community with vegetables grown in a way that's healthy for you and good for the planet. To learn more about Farmer Jones Farm, visit FarmerJonesFarm.com. Good, good question. Yeah, it wasn't our color schemes are really like if I looked at the colors of our food, it would match, you know? Um, yeah, I mean, it's like 
hot pinks and reds and bright greens and add a little California love. You got avocados. Like your food should be beautiful, right? Like it should feel like the earth, like it came, like you, you are eating a piece of California. It's like fresh and it's healthy and it's nourishing and everybody should have access to that. Like nobody should not have access um, to these healthy foods. Um, so we don't, we're not like, we don't say that like, like it's a niche food like this is the food our people ate and subsisted off of like it's just naturally vegan or it's naturally gluten-free or whatever it is you know um we try to stay away from those fads because i feel like california cuisine sometimes it, it has taken that and um i'm like no this is like food with roots and there's like ancestry in here and like uh it tells a story and like these are the farms that we're like supporting when, you know, you get the veg mix on your za'atar manmushe. And like, this is where the za'atar, za'atar is like our superfood. Like that's the the um, the plant that I one day hope I can grow en masse in California. It's like the one thing that we source um, from the Arab world. Okay. Because um, it's indigenous to that area. And that plant is very resilient it grows through rocks it's like very much like us wow. you know like the, yeah. and it's like it's an antiseptic and uh, you know it's like really good to keep you know yeah uh, like mothers used to give it to their children before tests because it's like supposed to like improve your memory and i'm like that doesn't come from anywhere you know it's not right. no way like when you actually like look at the nutritional facts it's like oh you know, these, these are all things that stimulate, um, you know, uh, the brain. And yeah. that's why, that's why the mamas gave it for memorization <laughs> before oh, a big time. I love that. Like just the wisdom that, yeah, like our ancestors food. had it, but like now we're just like discovering these things, but it's like, no, it's been here all along. Let's celebrate that, you know? Um, yeah. It happens to be colorful because, you know, people want to eat colorful foods not to say like the more homely foods are not good either but like I really wanted I, I really I love color on my food yeah and the combination with the flavors too and use of herbs and spices can you talk about that as well like how do you I guess like how do you combine like those fresh flavors but then also bringing in some of the herbs and spices yeah I mean I think um <laughs> I would say uh, Levantine cuisine in particular, the thing that is really great about it is it's very flexible and versatile. Um, it's not overly in your face spicy. It can be, it depends on what parts you go to. Like my mom is from Gaza um, and in Gaza, they rely very ha heavily on chilies, right? Chilies are not indigenous to that area. Um, they came from India, they came by way of Americas, you know, like that's a beautiful thing that's you know they're they're a colonized space and, and that's what came out of it apparently they have a thing for avocados too i don't know what happened did the, the british brought them over and then they were like oh this is lovely you know um but uh so that that tends to be more chili forward and spicy um uh it in kind of the syria lebanon area it's going to be more herbaceous and um vegetable forward uh the land is really it's the fertile crescent right um and uh citrus that's like a big part of our cuisine is like garlic and citrus that comes from the mediterranean you know um influences and so i love that because you can kind of go all over the place a little bit um you can have things that are more sweet and earthy and then you can have things that are more like uh sour and pungent and tangy um so i try to vary it uh, but like the Zata blend that the spice mix is like a perfect um, description. I think of the trifecta of flavors of my cuisine. You have like the herby savory. Then you have the um, sumac that's in it, which is like a berry. And that's like the sour, tart, you know, acid, all of that. And then you have the sesame seeds, which is like the nutty, kind of more warming uh, yeah, so we, yeah, we pull, I mean, you know, we're in a region surrounded by Africa and West Asia and like all of these things kind of influenced us. Oh, 
That's and beautiful. So it smells and bop and, you know, it's like flexible. That's why we fuse very well with other cuisines. Yeah. I love how you bring all of that in. Just this last weekend, we were out um, foraging sumac. And sumac oh, has such yeah, a it's frozen beautiful, in the East Coast, right? yeah, yeah. beautiful flavor. And the natural lemoniness of it, yeah, I just... You put it in salads. You can, oh my gosh. yeah. 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 It's beautiful. And even sumac lemonade, I guess. Yeah. We made uh, last year, actually, and it just, it's, yeah, incredible and beautiful yeah, It's a color. lovely, lovely spice to work with. Yeah. And savory applications. Yeah. So our podcast is called Farming for Health. When I say Farming for Health, what does that mean to you? Um, I think health is, a, you know, before I, I, I almost went into nutrition actually before I became a baker I was like really searching for like what are what are my people looking for like you know there's just like our people are not well (laughs) and um you know part of it was like they have lack of access to like fresh baked you know this 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 space right this communal space where you can get your fresh baked bread and like that food that is localized but I think the other part is like the somatics of mental health and how it relates to the body like our people are worn down right like living in this economy dealing with racism dealing with you know uh, displacement not being able to afford where you live all of those things have some wear and tear on the body um and so for me i wanted food that was like good for the soul that would like help the brain calm down a little bit so you can your body um so I, you know, I went from like nutrition, once I was like nutrition, or maybe I should do public health, and maybe I should focus on mental health, like there were a lot of things. And then I was like, No, I'm just going to be the cultivator of the food in the space. That's like where I landed on. But there were a lot of places I explored on my path to food. I knew food was going to be my calling and how to take care of people. But like, for me, it was like to take care of people's like, overall connection to roots connection to well-being because i know that um, i was really sick in college Um, i suffered a really bad depression and i moved to california and i like nurse you know with the help of my like uncle and aunt like nurse myself back to health kind of reintroducing foods into my body but it was kind of like the chicken and the egg thing right like my body was literally feeling sick it couldn't take in food so like if our mental health is not good and we're not surrounded by the things that actually make us feel whole, like food is not going to help us that way. So we need to really think about our food more broadly. <laughs> yes, I think that's such a good point. And I I do think there's a greater appreciation coming out about the connection between our food and our mental health and even our gut health and our mental health, right? Yeah. Like that gut brain connection and the color and the phytonutrients and how they're anti-inflammatory and antioxidant but like that's important if the body's inflamed whether it's physical inflammation emotional inflammation right there's so many reasons why we get inflamed and tired and exhausted like you were saying and the way we process food too and like yeah how um, you are able to even get it into your body if at all right and I mean I think it ultimately comes down to like nourishment and that word really resonates with me but like how do you nourish somebody and I think you are doing a beautiful job of that yeah Um, Yeah, I don't want food to just be like here here's the food it's like I want you to remember the context in which you received that food I want you to remember the feeling I want you to remember the thing that you had, the aha moment that you learned, like all of those things actually, I I believe changed the makeup of our body. Like yeah. I don't think I would have healed had I not moved to California. And like, cause these foods were available in the East coast, but like, it's the way that my aunt and uncle that was like, let's go on a hike. Let's go to the bakery and get a baguette. Just take a nibble. You know, I couldn't eat. I literally couldn't um, hold food down because I was just oh so, gosh. I had like extreme acid reflux. My body had basically rejected sustenance. And so the context in which I was able to like bring food back into my body really mattered. And I think that that is the case for a lot of people. A lot of, I mean, even for me as a chef now, I like forget to eat, right? Because I'm just so busy. And like, 
that's not normal. It's not normal. We need to like, like the act of eating and enjoying a meal should be a sacred act, you know? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And I think so many times we put ourselves last, like it's feeding everybody else and, you know, yep. taking care of everybody else, but realizing, you know, how important nourishing yourself is. And thank you for sharing your own healing journey too. I think that's a really important story in like yeah. resilience and like how you were able to really refeed yourself and kind of, would you say like re, were you, were you able to like reconnect more with like foods that were culturally relevant or like, like uh, being with your aunt and uncle? How did yeah. how that? I think that's what it was. It was like, yeah. You know, I grew up in a uh, pretty Arab household. Like my mom was a working mom, so she didn't, we actually didn't, it was like not, unless we were going to the potlucks or going to like communal events where we get these foods and mm -hmm. she would cook at home, but she, she wasn't cooking with purpose because she didn't have the luxury to do that. She yeah. was going to school and working. And so it's like, here are the green beans and red sauce. It's like canned green beans and red sauce. But like back home, they would like, it would be fresh green beans and you know they'd be like tossing it in tomato you know it's just different and so i yeah. i think that i took those foods for granted and so in learning how to like cook them and you know i would say my uncle and aunt were a little bit more hippie <laughs> <laughs> and they're like they appreciated that stuff it's why they moved to california they were like let's cook from the cookbook you know and so like yeah. the result of like oh wow like, this is what a real tomato tastes like. Where has that been all my life? You know, I lived in the East Coast. We didn't have access to those ingredients. My mom didn't have the time. Um, so it definitely, like, made me relearn these, like, ancestral foods that I had taken for granted growing up with. There was some nostalgia, you know, because we have our traumas as we grow up. That was like, oh, that did remind me of a, a moment in time where, like, things felt good at home. You know, my mom you know, my mom really was doing her best to take care of us and keep the culture alive. It's like, you know, digging deep. Um, but yeah, like I think learning those food ways as an adult brought me back closer. I, in my book, I call it an Arab finds her vegetable roots. The vegetarian section is all about me figuring out, oh, I'm like part of a lineage, right? And like, and carry that torch, you know, to teach my child how to cook and teach others and yeah that's amazing well it's been such a pleasure talking with you i know our listeners are going to want to connect with you where is the best place for them to learn more about you and find you and your restaurants yeah so they can follow me um i would say instagram is uh the the best platform um to know my whereabouts i kind of bop all over the country <laughs> um reem dot it's at reem dot asil um, or they can uh, follow my website, reem-aseel.com. Um, Perfect. Sounds good. Well, thank you so much for being on today. It's been an absolute pleasure talking with you. Thanks for having me. Thank you for listening to Farming for Health. We hope that you enjoyed this episode. Connect with Farmer Lee Jones and I on Instagram and Facebook.